Let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Peter Kalman here today from uh, JCU, where he has recently finished up his PhD with David Goldwood. Um, uh, before he was at JCU, he was at the uh, National University of Ireland in Galway, and he started studying sponges. Um, then he moved a little higher up on the phylogenetic tree and, and shifted over to fishes uh, in about 2007 as a master's student at JCU and continued on for his PhD. And um, uh, for me, it's really cool to have him here because he studies this really uninteresting subject about evolution of diversity in marine ecosystems. And I have no idea why anyone would do that. Um, but, you know, he's doing it incredibly successfully and is, is really, uh, in terms of sort of the, the younger generation of scientists in this field, is really one of the up and coming figures. And I expect really, he's already done really great things, and I expect. Uh, even more of the same. So, that, Peter? Uh, thank you for uh, lying so much. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's always nice to hear. Uh, so yeah, today I'm basically going to be talking about uh, what I like to call an origin story, and it's basically all about the evolution and biogeography of coral reef fishes. And I suppose, like, like, uh, like Paul said, my own origin is in, uh, I did my undergrad in the west of Ireland. So uh, since we're actually getting so close to St. Patrick's Day, there'll be one or two uh, little factoids about Ireland in this, uh, in this talk, <laughs> just to kind of break up the, the whole thing. And uh, uh, it'll be a, a shoddy attempt at some humor, but also kind of a, a scaffold on kind of uh, changing the direction of where this talk's going to go. But this is mostly what I've been, uh, what I did in my, um, my PhD, and uh, so I'll be uh, taking you through all of that. And then what I've been doing for the last year, I've been working on plants at ANU, which has not been as much fun. But um, <laughs> and then I'm going to be working on fish again. So uh, I'll, I'll let you know um, what I'm going to be doing there and kind of direction my future research is going to be taking me. So the reason why I call this an or origin story is like, uh, Basically, these guys are the superheroes of the reef, okay? You've got a couple of pictures here of, uh, you've got Scaris up here, which is a parrot fish. And this, these, uh, the species within this lineage uh, do a great job of grazing the reef. They go along and they basically, they're like little lawnmowers that go along and uh, basically strip all the algae off, off the reef. And uh, they actually uh, create, new, create some space for uh, new colonization as well. So this is what, um, uh, a bit of an algae covered rock will look like after this guy has attacked it. And uh, there's also another species of parrotfish uh, known as Bob uh very big. And what they do is they, they're like excavators that go along and take big chunks out of the reef and uh, they actually redistribute it. Uh, you just don't want to be behind them when you, then they do it. Um, so there's all these different, uh, I suppose they have all these different superpowers and these different superheroes on the reef. You have uh, the butterfly fish here, which is very iconic on reef shield. They're basically are an indicator of reef health. And what's really cool about it as well is that uh, some studies have actually shown that they actually go along and eat all of the, so they're coralivores, they, they eat uh, coral polyps. And they have been known to actually eat diseased coral flesh as well. So they uh, can be quite good at uh, getting rid of diseased flesh on reef as well. And then you have other guys like the cleaner Ras who sets up a little cleaning station for his clients to come along and basically uh, takes all the ectoparasites off them. And then you have uh, things like uh, rabbit fish, which um, uh, do a really good job of cleaning out all the cracks in the reef. If you see these guys, they've got a very elongated uh, nose. And they kind of, when they chew, they actually look like rabbits. So that's what they call rabbit fish. And uh, they are really important for cleaning out all the little crevices and stuff around there. And uh, my old supervisor, Dave Bellwood, makes a good joke that uh, clean cracks make a good reef uh, with these guys. So, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, he won't be happy I stole that one. Um, so moving on, basically, the reason we need, we need to understand, yeah, we need to understand uh, where all these uh, superheroes have come from. So that's what an origin story. And like any origin story, before Spider-Man was Spider-Man, he was a man. And before uh, fish were called reef, or before you know, fish were called reef fish, they were just fish. So um, massive diversity, like so, fishes, and uh, as you all know, we're all fish. Anyone with a backbone is a fish. So, uh, and if you study anything with a backbone, congratulations, you're an ichthyologist. Welcome to the club. <laughs> so we have about uh, thirty thousand species, and it's about a five hundred million year fossil record. So going from something that looks like this, the 580 million years ago in the fossil record, you get things that look like just armored heads. But the real um, 
uh, real kind of diversity in fishes comes from uh, the origin of Teleos about 200 million years ago. So 96% of total fish diversity are in Teleos. And this is, these are basically all the fishes you find on reefs. Are the majority of them are all Teleos. So um, we can also see here, like the, you've got different ages of fishes here. And you can see that when you get up to here is where they have this massive expansion in, um, uh, reef fish or in fish lineages. So, but what's happening at the reef this time, okay? Um, well, you have you had reefs 500 million years ago, so they share, reefs and fish share a 500 million year history. But uh, they haven't been always so greatly intertwined. So um, what reefs would have looked like uh, 67 million years, or before 70 million years ago, they would have been dominated by these things called rudis, and they kind of look like an upside down um, uh, ice cream cone with some tentacles coming out of it. And so they were the dominant reef builders, not like what we know here as sclerotinian dominated reefs. Uh, and they would have been the main characters um, swimming around on these things would have been uh, these giant ammonites. Uh, they dominated the oceans at this time. But what happened was about 70 to 60 million years ago, you have this Mesozoic faunal transition where you go from something that's dominated by uh, rudis and ammonites to what we know as a modern coral reef, a sclerotinian dominated reef. And at the exact same time, you start seeing, before this, you, don't, you wouldn't see anything, any uh, fish fossils that looked like they live on a reef. But as soon as uh, uh, sclerotinians take over as reef builders, you have uh, this uh, really pretty assemblage of uh, fishes in the fossil record. So this here is some examples of some of the um, specimens you get from uh, the Monte Balca deposits in, uh, in Italy. And uh, what's really amazing about these things is that you can actually see similar things like this on the reef today. So you can actually hold up uh, specimens from the same groups and go, oh, you know, it's, it's easy to tell that this is, um, this is uh, related to that fossil lineage. And um, so we, it's here where we start to see things with really modified jaws and things that can actually feed on the reef, okay? Um, so to kind of look at, okay, where have these, these superpowers come from, all these modified jaws and all of these um, these interesting things like herbivory, you start to see uh, fossil forms that look like they might be herbivores on the reef at this time. So where have all these come from? And to answer this question and look at kind of the trophic evolution and the evolution of these uh, novel feeding modes, I uh, use a phylogenetic approach. And uh, this was my early work uh, in 2009 on labrids. And so basically we do uh, a phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic tree and we date it using a couple of fossils that we have in the fossil record. There, I say a couple of fossils because there isn't many fossils for these reef fish groups. That's why uh, taking this uh, phylogenetic approach can actually give us a bit more insight into um, where they've come from and what's happened in the group. So you can see here that uh, on this phylogeny or this uh, time calibrated phylogeny, I have uh, different uh, lineages that are highlighted uh, based on their uh, feeding modes. So you have uh, in white, you've got general invertebrate feeders, then you've got gastropods, other uh, herbivory, uh, fish cleaning, and foraminifera feeding, and a couple of other different things. So what you can see is that they're scattered throughout the, the tree here, and uh, there's a couple of pictures of what some of the species look like. You can also see within labyrinths, massive diversity of forms here. You can have something that's as small as a little cleaner wrasse right here, or as big as Bob and Metapon down here. Um, so, you can see that there's uh, quite a variety in here, but also in other groups. So I wanted to take a look at uh, the evolution of uh, coral uh, livery as well. So I looked at chelidontids, which are the butterfly fish. So here we look at, uh, again, we have the same sort of thing. We've got a, um, an evolutionary tree where we have time calibration down here. And uh, you can see the origins of different uh, lineages that have uh, become uh, coralivores through time. And there's both hard and soft uh, coral feeders as well. And so, to kind of look at this a bit closer, um, it's kind of hard to really see what's going on here. So I've got a smaller graphic here that I'll look at. So basically, if we have, uh, if we break down that um, evolutionary tree to just where the feeding modes are coming in. So along here, we have the different feeding modes. And every little triangle here is a, a, an origin on a separate lineage of that particular feeding mode. So for small invertebrate feeders, basically lots of things eat small invertebrates. And this is just for labrids at the moment. Um, then you have large gastropod feeding, you have herbivory, and all these other things. So looking at this, you can start to see some patterns. Early in the evolution of this group, we start to see your generalist feeding modes, your large invertebrate feeding, um, your large gastropod feeding is the second one to come in here. And while it's not anything that's uh, 
like you wouldn't consider a specialist feeding mode, a lot of different fish do this. What it's related to is uh, this uh, pharyngeal jaw apparatus within the center here where um, these fish are able to grind up um, gastropod shells. Um, and while a lot of other lineages do this, uh, a lot of other fish groups do this, labyrinths seem to be particularly good at it with, um, uh, um, with it actually originating twice. Uh, then we also have uh, herbivory here. So this here is the first uh, fossil of a parrotfish in the fossil record. It's not a very good fossil. It's about 15 million years old. So that's the first evidence of, uh, river, of um, herbivory within labyrinths in the fossil record. But you have all these other fossils up here that are linked to uh, uh, herbivores. Uh, and they come in in the Monte Balca deposits about 50 million years ago. So what this tree is suggesting is that herbivory in the labyrinths is actually uh, has an origin back in the Eocene as well, which um, uh, coordinates with uh, the origin of herbivory in other groups as well. So while I'm, I'm still holding out hope that uh, there'll be a nice uh, fossil paper on a little parrotfish from the Eocene at some stage that will prove that that lineage, is what, that lineage was around. And it may not look exactly like this, but uh, I do believe that herbivory was an important um, aspect of living on a reef back then. Moving on to the next part of the uh, lineage here, or next part of the uh, pattern. This is where you have this escalation in herbivory again. So you're getting these lineages of parrotfish coming on. They're doing all the scraping and all the, um, all the excavating and moving things around the reef. So it's just like es escalation in the actual like, relationship between these fish lineages and the benthos and the, the reef substrate that they're living on. And I mean, these, uh, the, um, the functions that these guys play on the reef today are extremely important and you can see this and there's a lot of studies that have actually looked at uh, reefs where these guys are fished out and you can see that they're uh, going into what's called a phase shift into a macroalgal dominated state which can be uh, very, uh, very bad for, uh, for the environment and they don't support as much diversity as well. At the same time, we then start to get all these specialists in the, in the evolutionary record. So while um, before you just had things that were doing the same things that w other things would have been doing off the reef, you have uh, all these specialist feeders that are feeding on coral mucus, plankton, foraminifera, and even fish cleaning, um, uh, originating in the fossil record or in the molecular record here. And you can see there that these are just some um, some examples. Um, so these are the real specialists. It's like a second wave of innovation within this group where you're having these extreme specialists um, moving into different niches at this time. And it's all, it's, so this is in the Miocene between uh, about uh, 25 and 5 million years ago. So it seems to be just massive expansion in, at least in the trophic diversity that you find in these groups. Also at the same time, if we look at the, the corollivary, uh, the evolution of corollivary in Ketodon, the butterfly fish, you can see again you're starting to get those uh, lineages turning on and becoming corollivorous um, and you have them also in a couple of different spots on that tree as well so there's multiple origins uh, so, you have, so you're getting this at the same time that you're getting all these other specialists coming on in the, in the labyrinth tree as well. Now when we move to uh, the last 7.5 million years you can see that there's actually not been anything new really added to the system. It seems trophically that there's been, there's been a slow there. There's been nothing new has been added to the, the trophic diversity of coral reefs. So it seems that basically all of the, the roles have been taken, all of the, um, all of the functions are being played by uh, these uh, lineages on reefs and uh, that the reef system was probably intact for the last 7.5 million years. Now, this doesn't mean that diversification and new lineages aren't being unearthed, that speciation isn't going on in these, uh, these taxa. That's, that's true. Um, you're getting a lot of diversification and a lot of young lineages are in here, but you're not getting anything new. You may have, a, there's a couple of uh, ketodon lineages that are uh, coming on and uh, being corallivores at that time, but there's nothing new. The system seems to be intact. Um, what is interesting about this little study as well that there doesn't seem to be a link between specialization um, or like trophic specialization or trophic novelty and how many species you have in your lineage. So if you think, uh, if you look here, so this is just the number of species in a, in a lineage versus the age of that lineage, um, you can see that we've got two examples here. You have um, Scarus and Hipposcarus, which are both uh, extremely similar and very closely related. 
but uh, the Scarus lineage has 53 species, while the Hipposcarus lineage only has three. And to me, that seems a bit strange that there's something more going on that it doesn't seem to be this direct link between, oh, if you are a specialist, you, you can gain access to this um, very unique um, trophic niche, and then you expand into that thing. There seems to be something more that's going on. So if we actually go back to our uh, Chelidontid tree, and I actually want to look at, OK, if we look at all the, all the, the clades on this tree, at what point on this tree are we getting those lineages that, you seem, that seem to be uh, more, are significantly more diverse than you would expect, given the, the background rate of evolution within the tree? So if you see here, everywhere you see a little star, is basically, there's a couple of different metrics that I use. And it's basically telling me that each of these clades except for clade three here, seems to be significantly more diverse than you would expect. There seems to be some sort of rate shift going on. But the fact is that the entire lineage here also seems to be. What's interesting is that clade three here has most of the, cor cor uh, most of the corallivores in it. But yet, it doesn't seem to be significantly more diverse than you would expect. So it doesn't seem that being uh, able to access corallivory or being a corallivore makes you any, any way more diverse. But what does seem interesting is that the shift onto coral reefs for this group occurs back here, right before you have the origin of this uh, Chetodon clown or Chetodon crown group. So it seems that the move onto coral reefs might actually underpin cladogenesis and this massive diversity that we see in this group. So to me, this is telling quite a clear story. It's a bit of a love story between uh, fish and coral reefs, and uh, this is a small attempt at humor. Uh, I show this uh, to coral biologists and like, oh yeah, that's, this is the beauty and this is the beast, but I think it's, uh, it's the other way around for me at least. Um, so basically, why, why, have coral, like, why have coral reefs and fish, why, how have they gotten so intertwined? It seems as if there's something important about the Miocene, that time period where you have um, these specialists coming on board, you have all of these, um, uh, all of these new things happening there. And you have this escalation and uh, the, the close relationship between um, uh, fish and the benthos. And it seems that for at least 5 million years, or 500 million years, they may have just been friends, um, maybe with some benefits from 16, 60 million years onwards. But uh, the relationship has grown into something more where these two cannot live without each other. Okay, you take the fish away from the reef, studies that show that the reef degrades. You take the corals away from the reef, you see that the fishes go as well. So looking through time again, trying to understand what, what this link between uh, the reef and uh, the ecological fauna is, uh, I wanted to look at basically when do things start to happen, at least in, uh, like when do these lineages start to diversify? So I'm going to show you uh, a series of plots here where it's uh, on the side you have the log number of lineages uh, accumulating through time, and this is time on the bottom here, and uh, just the major um, epochs denoted here. So for four different groups. I'll just show three of these here at the moment. So these are labrids, pomocentrids, and apogonids. And here is the, how their lineages are accumulating through time. So I will I'll forementioned that uh, these, are, these are based on phylogenies that are not completely sampled. So there is a bit of a caveat there. Um, but I'll explain why I don't think that's uh, much of a problem for the story I'm telling. Uh, so you can see here that initially there seems to be kind of a, a bit of a rapid rate. Um, you can see some signal of that there. And then when you get to a certain point, there's an upturn in uh, the tempo of lineage origination. And you seem to have more of a pure birth model coming from the Oligocene to Miocene, where they just seem to rapidly escalate. And also, these are going to be the, the parts of the tree where if you're adding all those species that aren't sampled in these phylogenies, that line is going to move up here. And it's going to show that signal even more. And also, the, so something's going on with uh, the ketodontids as well, where you actually have a rate shift within the Miocene as well. So it seems that something's going on right here in the Oligocene, and then in the Miocene as well, something's driving the accumulation of species rates, or speciation rates. So to take a bit more of a um, kind of statistical approach, I actually examined these lineage through time plots using a couple of different uh, diversification scenarios. And what came back is that the best fit for these models was uh, a two epoch model where at, the, at least for labrids and pomocentrids you have kind of a decreasing diversification rate through time to a point and then you have uh, more something that looks more like a pure birth model and uh, you can see here that this isn't the full history of uh, each of these groups I cut off uh, 
uh, a bit at the, the more recent end, which should account for some of that unsampled uh, taxonomic bias that you will get if you think of uh, the pull of the present and also under sample lineages as well. So what seems to be going on is that at least here you have uh, a decreasing rate followed by a pure birth rate, and uh, this, the time of these shifts are quite similar. In the ketodontids, which are a bit younger, you have, uh, it could possibly be a rate shift at one point where you're having one rate and then a new one, and this little point here actually coincides with the timing of uh, the origin of uh, the ketodon lineage that I showed you before, where they move on to reefs. Uh, but it's also possible that the, it could just be a birth death hypothesis where uh, as you get closer to the present there's less uh, of extinction there's less effective extinction so it may not be a proper rate shift something else is going on in the apogonids where you seem to have two different rate shifts through time you have a lower rate a higher rate and then it slows down again so what could this mean well this is what I think it means and uh, again I've got a little schematic diagram here so if you imagine that there's an extinction event happening between the Oligocene, uh, uh, the Eocene and the Oligocene. If you looked at the fossil record, you would see something like this, where uh, things are accumulating through time, you get to that uh, extinction event, those fossils are taken out of the record, and then only the ones that are surviving are uh, forming new fossils in deposits. So you're seeing increasing numbers of genera in the fossils again. So if, you're look, if you were to look at a phylogeny where we're only looking at extant species, we're only sampling these extant species, anything that's gone extinct you're going to remove those lineages from your phylogeny. It's not going to be there. So you're going to have this kind of bend in the phylogeny. And then once you get past that extinction event or that time where extinction was higher, you're going to start uh, accumulating more lineages again in uh, um, kind of a pure birth fashion. So is there any evidence of this? Could, this, could there be uh, an extended period of extinction within uh, the history of these groups? Well, there is a potential for it. So, um, I'll talk a bit more, more about this later when I talk about the biogeographic stuff, um, but uh, you have this change in uh, centers of biodiversity at the time where back uh, 60, 65 million years ago, you had uh, in the Tethys region, which is now the Mediterranean, you had very shallow water habitats. And if you look at the fossils of uh, things like forearms where you have that are tightly linked to areas like that, you have a uh, center of diversity within that area. But as you move towards the present, the fossils actually shift. The center of diversity for those fossils shift from the Tethys region across to the, the Indo-Pacific, or what we call the Indo-Australian archipelago, which is the IAA. So basically, at this time, you have this flip where um, the, when the, um, um, the African plate is moving up, uh, it's actually squashing all that habitat. So you'd imagine a lot of things are going to go extinct at that time. Um, and a lot of habitat is being removed. So if you can make it over to the IAA, you're going to survive. So as this uh, hotspot is decreasing, another one is uh, becoming apparent. So you'd, you'd expect that some of, the some of these lineages are going to uh, disappear in that time. So I mean, we actually need a bit more evidence for this and we need to look at the fossil record. The problem is, is that the fossil record for these guys, like I said, was um, uh, pretty sparse. But if we look at the fossil record for all marine organisms, okay, just looking across the board, and what you can see here, so this is just detrended data from um, a, a paper. Um, oh, I don't have a reference there for it. Um, but basically, you can see a drop uh, in fossil numbers of uh, marine taxa at the, the KT boundary or the K. PG boundary, whatever it's called these days. So that's when the, you have that uh, meteorite impact that supposedly killed the dinosaurs. So uh, basically you have the mass extinction event there. But if you also look at this Eocene and Ligocene boundary, you have a, an extended period here where you're getting the removal of fossils as well. Now it's not as drastic as back here, but it could be some signal that we're having um, this uh, loss of taxa at this turning point here. So if there was that um, uh, cryptic extinction event, what happened afterwards? Well, if we look at our uh, plots again, here I've actually plotted on each of these, um, each of these lineages. Basically, the lineages that were found to be significantly more diverse than you would expect. So basically, every little dot here is a lineage where if you look at the extant diversity of that clade, it's, it's age, and compare that to the rest of its phylogeny, uh, it appears to be significantly more diverse. And what I did also is, because you can't estimate extinction very well in these types of cases, I did it across a range of extinction values. So basically estimating these parameters at zero are from 10 to 
and then greater than 50%. So all the red ones are basically the ones that even if you um, ramp up your uh, a priori extinction value, um, these um, lineages still remain significantly more diverse than you would expect. Some of them could, you could even up to 90% uh, extinction. So basically for out of 10, 10 potential lineages, nine of them would go extinct and one would survive. And I even took some, um, some measures of these, uh, uh, or some estimates from other groups as well. So you have uh, so tetrodontal forms here, palmacanthids, and there's also three um, gastropod genera down here as well. Um, and you can also see as well that they seem to cluster within the Miocene. There's one or two outside, which means there could be something else going on in that particular lineage. But there seems to be this concentration of significantly more diverse lineages within the Miocene. And if we look closely at our fish um, lineages, you can see that these are all the things that we find on coral reefs that are, you would go out and you're more, you'll, more often than not, you'll see all of these guys out, hanging out on the reef. So it appears that reef occupation seems to be a, a major factor in um, uh, this link between diversification or significantly more diversification in the Miocene. And we can actually take it a bit further. If we look at each one of those um, family levels, the families that I, I showed you before, and we, and we plot the rate of diversification for that particular family and the percent of coral reef occupancy, we can actually see you, at, um, at a zero extinction, we have a significant um, uh, correlation there, a uh, significant trend. But even when you uh, ramp up the extinction as well, you still have a significant trend. So basically, there seems to be a significant relationship between the percent of reef occupancy of a family and the global rate of diversification of that family. So basically, reefs, coral reefs seem to act as drivers of cladogenesis, of diversification for the lineages that live on them. What I also did as well was uh, basically looked at the ability of a lineage to maintain that high diversity rate, even when high simulated extinction. So this is basically, I'm looking at those lineages that were specifically found to be significantly more diverse than you would expect. And basically, the, the extinction level at which they still remained significantly more diverse than you would expect. So basically, anything down here was something that was found to be significantly more diverse, but as soon as you um, um, simulate higher extinction, that falls out and just becomes another um, non-significant clade. And what you can see here is that uh, among all these families, there actually is a significant relationship where the higher um, your, the more species in your lineage, it also, um, the higher that your, sorry, the more species that live on coral reefs in your lineage, the higher extinction level you can withstand and still maintain that significant diversification rate. So what this also seems to suggest is that coral reefs can act as a refuge. So basically on a coral reef where these guys are living, they seem to have, um, they seem a bit more resilient against extinction. So um, it's a, like, it's not a direct correlation, but you can see that there's potential that coral reefs could have acted as a refuge where anything outside on a non-reef environment of the same lineage may have had, may have been influenced by a higher extinction, event, higher extinction rates. Okay, so there's one thing I'm actually leaving out here and I haven't really talked about the biogeography yet. So uh, the main kind of biogeographic question that uh, we like to talk about in uh, uh, coral reef fishes is, is this thing called the marine biodiversity hotspot. And this is in the Indo-Austrian archipelago where you have uh, the coral triangle in here where you have the highest concentration of, uh, marine, of uh, reef organisms across lots of different taxa. This particular um, graph here is showing this bullseye pattern uh, of decreasing species richness across the Indo-Pacific and this is for 10 reef fish families. It's modified from uh, this paper here. And so you can see as you move away from the central Indo-Austrian archipelago area, the fewer species you get. And this should not be mistaken with the latitudinal uh, diversity gradient that you see in other things. This is a longitudinal gradient across a tropical region. Uh, so what's interesting about this is even though you have this really um, enigmatic gradient, you can also identify regional assemblages. Okay, so any, basically you can go anywhere, within each of these regions there is a certain um, um, component of a, a reef fish assemblage that sh you should be able to use to identify where you are. So basically any ichthyologist worth of salt, if he was kidnapped and forced to dive on a reef that he didn't know where it was, if he was uh, any way good at all, he should be able to identify relatively where he is in the world based on the, um, the species that he finds there. And this is why ichthyologists get so annoyed when they watch old James Bond movies where he's supposed to be fighting someone underwater in the Atlantic 
are in the in the Caribbean, and you're seeing species that are found in the Mediterranean. So it just like <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. They didn't really put a lot of thought into it. So that's basically, you can identify, even though there's this gradient of species richness, you can actually identify these regional assemblages. And this is even some recent work. This is a better, uh, a new paper that's just come out, like Kubicki et al in PLOS One. This actually takes a statistical approach to actually identifying uh, um, these marine provinces or um, um, these different realms, if you will, where they're more closely related. The taxa you find there are more closely related to each other. So this is a um, regression tree analysis here where you can identify the different uh, um, uh, realms, like the Indo-Pacific realm, the Central Indo-Pacific region, and all these other things. And there, this, isn't, this is just based on species uh, surveys done at these, all these little areas, and it groups them according to uh, um, what a lot of ecoregions that they're in as well. So this to try and understand this, um, why you have such a diverse gradient across the Indo-Pacific, but also how you can identify regional assemblages, there's been a lot of uh, arguing back and forth uh, surrounding these three ideas, which are called the center of hypotheses. And basically, it's trying to understand basically where all this diversity in the center has come from. So the first one up here is called a center of overlap, where you have an Indian Ocean uh, biota and a Pacific Ocean biota, and they just so happen that they overlap in the central Indo-Australian archipelago area, and that's why you've got the higher species richness there. The center of accumulation, also sometimes called a center of survival or center of refuge, basically predicts that, well, it says that speciation happens on the periphery, and it just so happens that uh, through dispersal and higher survival potential within the IAA, that that's why you have um, the center of diversity within the IAA. It's got nothing to do with this area being particularly um, high in uh, speciation rates, but it seems that they just seem to be good at maintaining species diversity. Um, the last one is the center of origin, where you basically, this IAA uh, is a complex area with lots of shallow marine basins. And when uh, basically um, sea levels fluctuate, um, it can uh, lead to um, uh, reproductive isolation, forming new species, and as these new species move, these, mo these new species uh, are formed, they uh, expand their range outside, and so that's why you find uh, fewer species outside, because you've got newer species in the center always being generated. As you go out, you've got fewer species. So these different theories make predictions about where you're going to find the youngest species, and the, the most um, range restricted ones. So out here in the accumulation you should have the youngest species on the outside where the spe new species are being formed whereas in the center of origin you should have the youngest species in here and when what we think of a young species is something that would be an endemic it's only found in a very restricted range that you could try and consider that as a, as a, as a new species or the place where that species was formed. It doesn't always work like that you can have old uh, small range species as well uh, but the thing is that um, all of these um, uh, theories are not mutually exclusive, but what we need is a handle on the, um, the actual um, biogeographic evolution within the group to try and assess what's going on. So um, I should go forward a bit. One, one thing I also want to mention is this whole hopping hotspot theory where, like I said before, the center of diversity hasn't always been in the Indo-Pacific. If you look at uh, fossil deposits for Foraminifera, uh, you see uh, this shift from a Tethian Arabian hotspot over to the IAA. So this is going from uh, the late Eocene, early Miocene, and then to recent, where you have these fossil numbers are showing a dramatic shift um, from a, a Tethys hotspot to an IAA hotspot. You can't really see this in reef fish lineages because um, we don't have the taxa to show the, the, the fossil taxa to do it. It's quite sparse. This is just some of the, the taxa that I've looked at or some of the, the fossils I've looked at. Um, so what I wanted to do was using some biogeographic methods to basically look at all these uh, phylogenies that we have and go, okay, we know where all these species are found, but where, where have they come from? Where, is their, uh, where have they originated from? Where have they dispersed to? Has there been some local extinction? So this uh, program called the Grange basically takes all of the extant uh, species. So this is um, the, those uh, tropical realms where all these species are found. So the Indian Ocean, the IAA, Central Pacific, East Pacific, and Atlantic. 
And it basically works back and says, okay, at the, at the next node down, what's the most uh, likely biogeographic scenario? And it'll basically tell you things like um, if uh, a speciation event was sympatric, and when I say sympatric, I don't mean real sympatric speciation. I mean that that node, that speciation event occurred within the same um, marine basin, okay, or within the same marine region. So it's not, uh, I have to be very careful with that. Some people don't like me using sympatric at all. So, um, and then you have things like vicariance where, um, uh, a speciation event occurs uh, at a barrier between two regions. So uh, a good one here is uh, Heniochus down here where you have uh, a speciation event between the Indian Ocean and uh, the IAA where on that side some barrier separated those two and they became different species. Um, so basically we can count all these things up and see, okay, look at the patterns basically at the, at the tips of the tree and also back through time and see, okay, where was the center of origin for these things? Uh, has there been dispersal going on? Um, and basically where does this biodiversity hotspot come from? So this is my little uh, figure here. I spent hours drawing like detailed um, global maps and then I realized you couldn't put any information on it. So I drew this on the back, back of a napkin one day and uh, it seems to have done okay so far for explaining this sort of stuff. So this is the, these are all the main basins over here. Okay, along the bottom you've got your East Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, uh, the IAA and the Central Pacific. And these are basically the patterns found for these three groups of fish again, the labyrinths, pomocentrids, and chelidontids. So in the circle, in the little black circle, that's the total diversity of that region, okay? This is just for the tips of the tree, okay? So this is um, all the species that are found in the Central Pacific. There's 240 of them across these three groups. And then you have all these arrows going around. So these arrows coming down here. This identifies the number of those lineages that were actually from speciation events that occurred within that region. So this is from this Lagrange analysis where it, it basically says, okay, um, what's the most likely scenario at that particular node? So basically 21 lineages in the Central Pacific uh, were from processes promoting speciation within that region. Then we have uh, these arrows going between regions, which actually shows how many lineages managed to expand their range beyond their um, um, beyond their origin point and uh, into um, the next um, basin. So you can see here, obviously the Indo-Australian archipelago is, has quite high species richness. Also a lot of species seem to be formed within that realm and it seems to also donate new species either side. And what's interesting is it seems that like the, the ratio between them seems to be quite even as well. Uh, you can also see here that not much um, uh, lineage transfer is going, or dispersal is going on through the, uh, uh, between the Indo-Pacific area and uh, the Atlantic and also uh, the East Pacific as well. They, they, they seem to be separate entities. And if you actually look, at, uh, do some simple statistics on this, if you look at, so this uh, figure here is showing, okay, if we think about how many of those lineages originate within a region and basically what percent or what proportion does that account for for that regional species pool. So here we can see that if you do this, and this is across the, the three uh, groups here, you can see there's error bars representing the different um, percentages among groups. Uh, you can see that uh, the East Pacific, the Atlantic, and the IAA all stand out as areas where uh, most of the extant lineages in those regions today arose within those regions. So basically they are their own little kind of uh, speciation engines going on in there, promoting the um, diversification within those regions. And you can see here that the Indian Ocean and the, and the Central Pacific, they have very low levels of regional origination. So basically most of their diversity comes from some other region. And we can see quite clearly that it's from the Indo-Australian archipelago. Um, so basically, yeah, I just said that. Uh, next, if we look at it from a global perspective, if we look at the percentage of, or the proportion of regional origination that accounts for the family richness across the globe. So again, this is for across those three families. We can see that only the Indo-Australian archipelago hotspot stands out as being significantly more uh, diverse, or basically it's, it accounts for uh, about 60% of the diversity arose within the IAA for each of those families. This is based on this uh, by geographic reconstruction. So now we can also look through time. Okay, so here we have different time slices and I'm just looking at the um, number of lineages going back and forth among those regions for, for uh, the Labrids, uh, the Ras family. Um, 
And what we can see is back in the Paleo Eocene, we have uh, this global pan mix here where there seems to be lineages going back and forth. And, uh, but you also have ranges starting to accumulate in the Indo-Austrian archipelago at that time, which seems a bit, uh, a bit bizarre uh, because um, you would think that we have a fossil record that shows that a biodiversity hotspot was back in the Tethys region, which would have been kind of the Atlantic or um, the Atlantic and um, Indian sort of regions. You'd expect to see more uh, diversity back there, back then. Uh, when you get into the Oligocene, it becomes a lot clearer that uh, you have this regional vicariance where you're starting to have some of these, um, some of these uh, marine regions are starting to become isolated. Uh, you have some restricted dispersal, so not many lineages are able to expand their range uh, from one region to the next. Uh, but what you're having here, and I, I put it down as survival within the IAA, because if you, this analysis can't account for global extinction of a lineage. So if you think that um, it can basically say, oh, it can um, account for a, a possible local extinction event. But uh, if you have lineages that are removed from, uh, removed completely, you don't have those sample in your phylogeny. So if you take those lineages out, again, it's, it's, um, it's like, as I showed before, if you take those lineages out, you're gonna have that different pattern. Um, so what this is telling me is if you, if you think of a global extinction at that time, and like I said, it could, there could have been some extinction going on back then, um, it appears that anything in the IAA seems to have survived that particular time period during the Oligocene and early Miocene. Uh, so naturally, uh, for this analysis, only using extant lineages, it's going to push that, uh, the origin of this biodiversity hotspot back in time because you only have those lineages that are surviving within that area present today. Uh, moving on to the Miocene, we again, we see, this, uh, we see a leap in origination across all regions. Uh, but more so in the IAA, and again, this is to do with the fact that there's already so many lineages that are already accumulating there and already starting to diversify. Again, you have some dispersal. Uh, once you get to the Pliocene recent er uh, period, so five to zero to present, uh, you have some origination, but it's starting to slow down again. And what you do have is increased dispersal from the IAA out to um, adjacent regions. So uh, looking at this pattern, you can actually see that um, there's actually a couple of different things going on. You have um, uh, basically the IA is acting sequentially and simultaneously as a center for uh, lineage accumulation, survival, origin, and expansion at different times and uh, also sometimes simultaneously. Um, to look at it in another way, this is a small graphic I have here where basically I'm just looking at uh, the expansion of lineages within the Indo-Australian archipelago based on that analysis. So have different color schemes here. So this black area here is basically when you only have those lineages that are coming in and uh, are basically part of uh, widespread lineages that are found across the globe. So remember I said that panmixia was uh, quite apparent in this period. Uh, moving on to the Oligocene, uh, we start to have some uh, origination of new lineages within the IAA. But what we have is uh, uh, we're starting to get a breakdown of those widespread lineages, so a lot of vicarians, some uh, local extinction going on as well, and we only have these lineages that are, starting, that are surviving within the IAA. Uh, moving on in the Miocene, you can see that this is where the IAA hotspot really turns on, that you have that massive, this massive red area coming out here is denoting those lineages that are starting to expand. And um, you can see it's quite... Um, quite substantial when you, when you look at it. Uh, what you're also having here is uh, this uh, dash line here represents the, uh, the number of lineages that are dispersing out of the IAA into the adjacent regions either side. Now when we look at the Pliocene, so the last five million years, uh, we see that uh, there's not a lot of um, uh, new, not, not many new lineages actually coming on in, uh, in this time period. What's happening is those old lineages that are originated back in the Miocene are just surviving. And even to the point that, uh, so the average uh, lineage age for Labrids as, uh, uh, from this, uh, this study was about 7 million years. Um, so basically, again, it's as if the, the reefs were, uh, were, t were um, get it, were, Diversification in, these, uh, in this particular family was starting to slow down at that time. Um, and then you just have uh, the main process that's going on here is the expansion of those lineages out of the IA to uh, adjacent regions. 
So again, this has shown that uh, like a lot of people have talked about whether it's been a center of, of accumulation or origin or survival. And in fact, it's had a quite a dynamic role. Um, and uh, there's se there seems to be uh, something uh, interesting going on with this. And I think it definitely requires further work. OK, bit of a break. Irish fact number one. So obviously, I tell someone I'm Irish. The first thing they ask me is, can I speak Gaelic? And I tell them I can speak Irish, but there is more than one Gaelic language. OK, so looking at the, uh, yeah, there's more than one Gaelic language. Well, if we look at a tree of languages here, so there's actually, uh, you have uh, three different um, <coughs> Gaelic languages. You have Irish, you have Manx, which is only spoken in the Isle of Man. And then you have Scots Gaelic spoken in Scotland. And then you have these other Celtic languages, Welsh, Cornish, which is pretty much extinct, and Breton as well, which is only spoken in northern France. So I speak the green bit over here. Um, but you can see that it's, it's already uh, apparent that... Uh, sorry. The barriers play an important role here. So you can see that obviously there's splitting going on. But you need... We need some sort of directionality to see, okay, what lineage is split first, and things like that. And it's actually quite an interesting, uh, interesting um, topic looking at language evolution as well. Anyway, back to fish. So if we look, uh, there's, there's one thing that I didn't uh, talk about, and that's, I kind of mentioned it, the whole vicariance among regions. And a lot of study have gone into a lot of barriers to dispersal in the ma marine environment. And one in particular that you, you probably know quite well is uh, the, the rising of the Isthmus of Panama. Now that had a lot of repercussions for um, uh, terrestrial life uh, going from across the continents. Um, but it also uh, provided a real kind of evolutionary experiment uh, that people are studying uh, between the East Pacific and Atlantic regions where you have lineages that date to the age of that closure and that's they're called Gemini pairs where you can see okay this split happened at about 3.1 million years ago and that coincides with the final rising of the Isthmus of Panama. So again what are these um, what are these barriers across the world so here's a few so again I already mentioned the, the Isthmus of Panama uh, we have what's known as the East Pacific barrier and um, that's basically a massive expanse, uh, expanse of uh, distance where there's no, um, there's no habitat for, um, there's a lot of deep water and uh, fish can't really maintain a, a genetic connection across it. There are, are some fish that can, but as, um, there hasn't been much of a review done of this yet. The IOP, the IOP has been studied quite well. Also, there's been some talk of the terminal Tethian event, which uh, its final closure is probably about 12 million years ago but uh, it seems to stretch back a bit further as well. It could have been starting to close about 18 million years ago. There's some uh, evidence that it may have even closed earlier, back in uh, about 60 million years ago, where you have it closed and then opened again. You had, for a time, you had an endemic fauna uh, um, within that Tethian um, Mediterranean region. And then uh, also, like even though that's closed, that, the te terminal Tethian event closed off the connection between Indian and Atlantic Oceans, you still have some species may be able to get around the bottom here. And uh, there's been some um, papers looking at that. And also, like more recent times, you have Lesepian um, uh, dispersal from um, across the, the canal there. OK, so other two barriers are other barriers within the Indo-Pacific. And the thing about the Indo-Pacific is that there's it's all water, and there's a lot of connection going on there. But there have been some uh, studies showing that there are barriers either side of the Indo-Australian archipelago. But again, there's been no kind of consensus done of this yet. So what I wanted to do was go, I went through all my, uh, my phylogenies again after um, the biogeographic analysis, and uh, basically counted up all the vicariance events, and basically just wanted to look at the pattern of them, what was going on. So here we have basically through time the accumulation of uh, those uh, vicariance events that were uh, reconstructed on the trees I was looking at. And you can see that it just seems to, uh, con it seems to uh, um, uh, uh, increase as you go towards the present and there's a little, little dip here in the Pleistocene time period. Uh, now you look at this and say, okay, well, this just looks as if it's a, a constant rate of vicariance. When you think of that, lineages are, are accumulating through time in a similar fashion. So there's obviously, the more lineages you have accumulating, the more chance, the more chance you'll have that a vicarious events is going to occur and you're going to encounter it. And you're, you're exactly right, because uh, if you compare this, um, as, if you compare this uh, diversific or vicarious 
uh, through time with the actual uh, diversification through time, you can see that for discrete time periods, there's no difference between like the proportion of vicariance events to uh, potential uh, nodes on the tree. Uh, it's there, it's not significantly different. So that's telling you that there's some sort of um, uh, constant rate of vicariance through, through time. But if you look at the individual um, the individual barriers, so here I just did a quick kind of graph comparing what you would expect the number of vicariance events to be given the total number of vicariance events and the number of vicariance events occurring in each time period and compare them to your actual observed. So the, uh, the dotted line is the, uh, what you would expect and the black line is what we observe. And so basically we have our, uh, our hard barriers here, the terminal tethium and the IOP, which are those land barriers, and then we have our soft barriers here, and then the, the e EPB as well, which is also a soft barrier. What you can see is that, uh, basically to sum this up, the hard barriers, uh, they show um, more older events than expected and fewer younger events. And you expect them to be a few fewer younger events because after the land bridge is up, uh, nothing can get past it anymore. Uh, but having the older events is interesting, and I'll talk a bit about that in the next couple of slides. Uh, but for the soft barriers, what you have is um, you have fewer older events and more younger events. And this is, in particular, you can see this in the Indian Ocean IAA barrier. So to look at this a bit more, so I've got a couple of graphs here. This is showing for the labyrinths, pomocentres, and cutodontids. You have uh, the spread of the um, the number of vicariance events associated with each barrier. And I've also I've brought red lines down here to show when that barrier is estimated to have happened. And to sum this up, basically, um, for, the so for the hard barriers, uh, it seems that you have uh, more of a temporally diffuse range of uh, vicariance events associated with them. So that seems to basically, um, for the uh, Isthmus of Panama, it seems to go back to the the late Miocene, you're starting to have those, uh, those vicariance events happening. And this actually coincides with some recent research that shows that at that time, uh, uh, the Isthmus of Panama would have actually been a chain of uh, volcanic islands uh, that would have disrupted gene flow between those two regions as well. Uh, also, um, you have more of a d um, dispersal, uh, or sorry, a more diffuse pattern for uh, the terminal tethian event where you see some older events, which could be related to that time period when uh, you had the endemic fauna when it originally closed and then reopened, called the paratethes. Um, and then you also have some younger ones, so it's showing evidence of uh, things getting around uh, that other barrier as well down here. And then what's interesting is for the um, soft barriers, you have this like uh, stack of events occurring and they seem to be, at least for the, the labyrinths and chelidontids, they seem to be quite close in age as well. So you have something happening uh, in about, at about 2.5 to 5 million years on the Indian Ocean side, and then earlier at about 6 million years on the Central Pacific side. So just to sum that up, um, if you look at the East Pacific Barrier, that seems to be periodically breached. Uh, you've got more west to east movement. They have from east to west, and there seems to be multiple causes. It just, it, I think it's just more... Uh, a random case that you s have something that's able to get across there. Uh, for the Isthmus of Panama, wider distribution, the age of vicariance events goes back to at least 10 million years, even more, uh, but there is more near the closure, so you can see the signal of how um, that was influencing it. Uh, the terminal tethian event, there is no temporal congruence, there might be possible evidence for the paratethes, and you also have some post-TTE movement around Africa. Um, but the hard barriers aren't that hard, Whereas when you look at the soft barriers, they seem to be more, uh, more temporally, temporally concordant, where you have that uh, uh, a number of vicariance events happening in a very uh, short time period either side. So it appears that some of the soft barriers may have more influence. Uh, and other thing is, this is these time periods. There, you might look at it and say, okay, it could be to do with uh, changing um, um, sea height. Um, but this is actually older than, so a lot of uh, sea height fluctuation happened during the Pleistocene. This is older and more in the Pliocene. So there was a lot of changing ocean currents going on at that time. So it could be something going on with that. Okay, so I've kind of run a bit over. I'll try and wrap this up. Uh, but basically I've shown you a couple of different patterns and I've told you some nice stories. Uh, but am I jumping, am I making a bit of a leap from pattern to process? And I think, 
I am a small bit, we need to be looking at something else. So, so yeah, oh, I'll skip that one. We stuck for time. So Irish fact number two, right? <laughs> can anyone tell me, can anyone hazard a guess at the population of Ireland back in, from the 2012 census? Anyone want to make a guess? 5,000. 5,000? 5,000, really? <laughs> Maybe Irish, yeah, because more people go into Ireland. Like, okay, um, well, actually, 4.58 million. And that's in the Republic only, okay? Anyone tell me what the population of Ireland would have been back in 1841? Someone got close, it was 6.5 million. So it seems a bit strange that uh, we've kind of lost a lot of our population between that time period. Uh, basically, there is a decrease in, of uh, about 4 million people uh, in our population. And if you actually look at uh, the census taking through time, uh, you can see like we had a bit of a population crash, okay? Um, and does anyone know what caused this? <laughs> Famine, exactly, yeah. The English stole all our spuds. <laughs> so we, we, all, we all basically came over here. Um, so this is really showing that uh, even though, like, I'm not saying the Irish are, are, are their own species or anything, we're, we're unique in many ways, um, but um, basically you need to start looking at some of the microevolutionary processes and the population level stuff that might actually be happening to understand uh, what, to see if there's any link with macroevolutionary processes. Uh, so for the last year I've been working with plants <laughs> and they're interesting, I, I prefer fish. Um, but uh, I've been working with, the, uh, um, with uh, uh, Lyndall Brahman and Marcel Cardillo in their lab, and here we are here, we're celebrating um, uh, the Melbourne Cup. If anyone's ever been to Australia, the Melbourne Cup is a horse race that lasts maybe a minute, and it stops the entire country for uh, a very long extended lunch break where we all sit around drinking. And we make what are called fascinators, where we have little flowers and stuff on top of our heads. And basically this time we were basically told that we had to uh, make our own fascinators and they had to be related to what we were studying or some of our past work. So you, you might be able to see the googly eyes of the parrotfish on top of my head there. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Dan Warren here, he's studying fish brains, so he's got a big brain on top of his head. Uh, and a couple other things. This is a mass extinction event going on over here. Um, so basically, uh, these are some of the papers and some of the work that's going on in this lab. Basically, we're exploring the causative links between genomic change, diversification, and life history. So I was involved in a paper where we looked at um, parasitic plants and basically looked at the origins of parasitism uh, across the um, angiosperms. And there's about uh, 12 uh, independent origins there. And what we did was we compared the molecular rate of those lineages to their uh, closest non-parasitic uh, sister lineage and we found out for every um, origination of parasitism uh, there was an uh, increased rate of uh, molecular evolution. So, and this is also uh, looking at diversification, you find a lot of evidence for a link between molecular, faster molecular rate and uh, higher diversification rates. So some of the things we're starting to look at is this big mess of things that can actually influence um, populations and uh, molecular rates and uh, also also go a long way to uh, uh, this link between speciation rate and molecular rate. So we've been uh, kind of looking at this and uh, I'll basically I'll try and wrap up now. Um, basically there's three possible hypotheses that we're looking at. Is speciation special? special so is it population level processes that are driving the um, driving this pattern or is it that uh, some lineages that happen to have higher mutation rates that are driving uh, more, um, uh, more diversification. Uh, or it could be an indirect correlation between a third factor, so if you think of environmental energy or something like that. Uh, so there's most evidence is coming from uh, mutation drive speciation. We've seen in angiosperms, birds, reptiles, and, uh, but it's not, there's no link in mammals. And yet this link hasn't been looked at in fish on a grand scale yet. So this is some of my future, future research I want to go through uh, where I'm actually moving to Yale to work with Tom Neer. And uh, we're basically going to look at mechanistic process and genomic evolution in marine biodiversity hotspots. So basically the, using a large fish data set, we want to look at this link between whether high diversification rates is linked to mutation or if it's population levels uh, processes such as species or sub such as uh, population subdivision that are driving substitution rates. 
And is there, anything, uh, is there any environmental geographic characteristics of hotspots that could be involved in this? So uh, with that, I'll say thanks very much and thank you all for your time. And I'll take questions. Sorry, I went over a bit. Yes? Well, I'd be the first to agree that it's probably deficient by now. <laughs> but it happens to everyone. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that not that many fish fossils Corals, by contrast, at least hard corals, have fossils. <laughs> they do. I would imagine they be fairly abundant. Yeah, they are very so good. So you could get a pretty good idea of coral diversity in an area. Yeah. And there is, in many cases, you know, birds studied by MacArthur years ago mm -hmm. and stuff, a, a, a strong correlation between species diversity and habitat diversity. Uh, it might be worth looking into. So my question, first, this will reduce to two questions. Question one, is there such a correlation with fish? Don't answer it yet. Uh, question two is, if there is such a correlation, what's driving it? Now, I can imagine two, two scenarios. One, um, corals diversify from time all by themselves, mm -hmm. and fish follow. Yeah. The second possibility is, and I've studied predators for a lot of time, a lot of my career, um, predators keep the common corals relatively rare, thereby allowing open space for further diversification. In that case, you would have high species diversity of fish, driving the evolution of higher species diversity of fish by allowing diversification of coral. And that could account for some of your bins right in the middle of the Okay, so question two is, if there is a correlation between habitat What's causing it? Yeah. What's causing it? Okay, well, question one, I say yes. And there's probably there's a lot of work that people have done looking at. I don't know if they've actually tried to test the correlation. They've, they've shown that there is a correlation between habitat area and species diversity across a number of um, uh, reef groups. But that's not the thing. No, so habitat. as habitat. So, well, so if you're talking about habitat, there is, I definitely think there's a link between the diversity of hard corals and the diversity of fish. Uh, you definitely tend to get more diversity. And even like big swaths of area of coral reef promote more diversification. But I think a lot of this stuff shows is that you don't, if you're looking at it from a prote per, um, protection aspect, uh, you need to protect very large areas of coral reefs to maintain that uh, diversity that you see there. And I didn't really talk about this much, but uh, in, the, in that um, biogeographic stuff I was doing, even though you're getting more, um, you're getting um, species moving out from the Indo-Australian archipelago to like more peripheral reefs that might be, um, that may not have uh, enough, uh, a ho as high a diversity of coral reefs, you're getting them out there, but then they're actually divers diversifying back in as well. So it's this like uh, loop that's going on as well. Um, someone has termed it the biodiversity feedback hypothesis that's just been out this year. Um, but, uh, I think you do have a good point about the, um, that fish diversity could also be driving further coral diversification and that could be, I don't think anyone's looked at that directly, I think that might be, uh, a really, I've seen one paper where that's shown that the diversification in um, corals is linked to the, diversifica the diversification in gobies as well that live in them, so that's a direct connection there, um, but I definitely think that uh, um, like the, the processes of those like key functional roles that things are that those fish are doing, like uh, cleaning habitat and allowing more uh, species to uh, to actually get in there of coral. So if you think of um, uh, the coral larvae floating all around the Indo Pacific, and where you have the highest concentration of herbivores, you're probably going to get the highest potential for colonization of those particular species. So I definitely think that's something that needs to be looked at. And like you said, like I mean, I. I kind of talk about that possible cryptic extinction event and uh, 
until we have more fossils, we won't actually know about that, but you could be entirely right, it could be herbivory that's driving, or those functional roles uh, that are driving that uh, association as well. I think it's... Worth yeah, it, it would. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do a dissertation again. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with wood. <laughs> Someone else wants to do it. Perfect. <laughs> Anyone else? Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.